talk, the closer you talk into the mic, the better it's going to sound. Okay. So the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy sleeping dogs. <laughs> The best sound check ever. Tell me your name. Tell me. Tell me your name and what you had for breakfast, Jan. Please. Jan Cameron Miles, captain with the pride of Baltimore too. Uh, for breakfast, I've been waiting. You haven't had breakfast yet. It's no. three. It's three o'clock. No, I, I. I'm. I'm at that point in life when you do one meal a day. That's that's good. That's good. That's healthy. Ahoy, shipmates, and happy new year! Welcome back to another episode of On the Wind. I'm your host, Andy Shell. It is 2024 when you hear this, although I am still in the past recording this. It's Sunday, December 31st, New Year's Eve, and Mia and I and Axel and Axel's grandma, Mia's mom, more, more, uh, we're in Portugal. Mia and I last celebrated New Year's Eve in Lagos back in 2019, and there's a pretty funny story because we didn't make a reservation for dinner, and everything was booked in town, so we're wandering around looking for a place to eat. We had walked like all the way down the beach earlier that night, and we found this Indian place basically at a gas station that was had availability, and we stayed there. Uh, we ate there. It was good food. It was fun. There was a group of people at the table next to us, like eight or 10 people, a very eclectic looking group of people, and we were chuckling because when they went to pay, they had just mounds of coins, and it turned out they were like street buskers, like street musicians, like street performers, and um, I guess they were having their annual dinner, New Year's Eve dinner together, and they paid with all the coins they had collected uh, from their busking, which was pretty funny. Uh, and here we are, back again, four years later for New Year's Eve 2023. Uh, we're here, of course, because it's the start of the 2024 season, and Falcon is hauled out down the road at Portimao. Alex and Adam arrive on the 2nd, and she goes back in the water on the 3rd. We'll bring her over here to Lago. she put the sails on, and get ready for the first crew to sail down to Las Palmas on January 6th. So it's been a nice holiday break. I hope everybody else has had a nice holiday break, and uh, it's very fun to get back into action and head back to sea. Mia's sailing the first trip with Alex as skipper, and I'm going to be here just to make sure the boat gets in the water and all set with Adam. And, uh, and then me and Axel go back to Sweden. Okay, what's on the calendar for us? I'm very excited for 2024. It feels like the first year where we're sort of ahead of the breaking wave of things to do instead of paddling behind it. Uh, so it feels, feels pretty good. I hope we get off to a good start. Um, things coming down the pipe. Uh, we're going to have lots more on the quarter deck. That's me and August doing that on the quarter deck. So if you want to support the podcast uh, or join us to talk about seamanship, go to quarterdeck.59-north.com and sign up to be a member there. We are launching Eastbjorn's 2025 calendar uh, very shortly. It'll be in the first week or two of January. Uh, we've got a fun calendar um, seeing the coast of Norway, the Faroe Islands, uh, and lots of fun stuff coming in 2025 for Eastbjorn. That's going to appear on the new website, which we'll be launching this week. We're coinciding that with Falcon's first trip. So blogs from the boat will go on the new website. We have new tracking maps that I've been working on that are really fun. And the site just gets a little refresh. Um, it'll look mostly the same to those of you that have been there before. But a uh, nice way to refresh and start 2024 off fresh. Okay, with that... Have a happy new year. I hope everyone had a happy new year's Eve. I know I will. And I will see you here in a week or so when Falcon is at sea until then hold fast on the wind is presented by pelagic autopilots, a group of dedicated sailors and engineers developing autopilot solutions for the blue water cruiser, solo sailor and racer pelagic systems have been tested in races and voyages around the globe. In fact, both boats at 59 North use Pelagic Autopilots, and we worked with Pelagic to build a custom unit for Falcon last year to suit her 30-ton displacement. Falcon's Pelagic Autopilot served us well for over 16,000 miles during her first offshore season and was one of the first new systems on board that didn't require significant tweaking after our initial sea trial. Pelagic's testing grounds are the Pacific Coastal Races, and their philosophy is to provide simple, self-contained products, requiring no connection to proprietary data networks. One of the biggest advantages to us uh, and the robust, redundant systems that we like to have on board Eastbjorn and Falcon. The Pelagic Autopilot uses the latest sensor and computer technologies to hold a course through the most difficult conditions. Pelagic Autopilots, built by offshore sailors for offshore sailors. Check out pelagicautopilot.com to learn more and spec your own system. 
On the Wind is also presented by Dive Blue, who make portable tankless scuba dive systems. We have one on each of our boats, in fact. Uh, enjoy diving on your own terms with a blue tankless dive system. What is tankless diving exactly? We like to think of it as innovation. Blue's tankless diving system gives divers an opportunity to experience the beauty of the underwater world without the constant worry of having heavy scuba tanks on hand. They carry two types of tankless dive systems, the Nemo system for tankless diving up to 10 feet and the Nomad system, which is what we have on Falcon and Eastbjorn, for depths up to 30 feet. For us, it's not just about having fun. It allows us to clean the bottom of the boats, fix a wrapped prop, or otherwise inspect the keel and things that you used to have to do either with heavy scuba equipment or by taking a bunch of free dive breaths. And this is uh, basically now a critical tool on both of our boats uh, in our maintenance toolkit. So anybody that's a sailor that's doing your own stuff out there, I highly recommend one of these systems. Um, The amount of money we've spent on divers over the years to clean the hull before a big passage would easily pay for a tankless scuba dive system. So check out the Nemo and Nomad dive systems at diveblue.com. That's D-I-V-E. B L U and then the number three dot com. Thanks again to Dive Blue for sponsoring the podcast. Quick note on today's episode: um, I've known Jan now for almost seventeen years, I think, uh, going back to my woodwind days. As I've said over the over the episodes here, there's a lot of things that go back to my woodwind days in Annapolis. But I first met Jan. Um, it must have been in 2006, my first season on the woodwind as a deckhand. I sailed in the schooner race that year on board the woodwind and one of my one of the coolest memories i have of sailing period anywhere is we're we're sailing down the bay woodwind is a, a a very weatherly boat compared to the traditional tall ships that have more square rigged and um and gaff rigged sails so it was an upwind start and we were like way ahead of the whole fleet and then a, a cold front went through overnight and the wind shifted suddenly from southwest to northwest and started blowing like stink as the skies cleared as it does classic uh, cold frontal passage. Anyway, as we're like screaming down the bay, surfing, I think we hit 15 and a half knots surfing, uh, coming across the mouth of the Potomac. Um, sure enough, the big ships started catching up with us. So on the horizon behind us, it was like a black night. The moon was out. It was really beautiful sailing. You could just see this silhouette of Pride of Baltimore too, which like looks like a pirate ship with this big square topsail. And it was just like, you'd see it and it's getting closer and closer and closer. And eventually they steamrolled past us pretty close to windward um and it was just one of the like magical moments of my sailing career that i that has stuck with me ever since then i've always wanted to sail on board pride i've been invited several times um and i still haven't yet made it happen but maybe this year's the year uh, but anyway that's when i first met pride and first uh, first met jan and got to go on board pride of baltimore and i've been huge fans of of the ship and captain jan miles ever since um, so it's it was really cool to get to interview Jan for the first time in 2015 in the captain's cabin on board Pride when she was in Annapolis, and now again for a second time also in the captain's cabin on board Pride uh, at the boat show this past October. So this is like where this is one of those interviews where I pinch myself that I get to do this for work. Like this is it was just so so cool, uh, and I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Captain Jan from the Pride of Baltimore. You're listening to On The Wind, my podcast about offshore sailing. I'm your host, Andy Shell. Captain Jan Miles returns to the podcast. I first sat down with Jan on board Maryland's flagship, the Pride of Baltimore 2, way back in 2015 for a fascinating interview tracing Jan's career at sea. We return to the captain's cabin on board Pride for this second meandering chat about seamanship, life on tall ships, the leadership structure on board traditional ships, and a whole lot more. We recorded this on board Pride at the Annapolis Sailboat Show back in October, and you can follow and support the ship at pride2.org. Uh, all right, Jan. Um, this is round two. The last time we did this... I believe in this cabin, onboard Pride, also in Annapolis. I don't remember how many years ago it was now. But, Neither uh, do I. So we went through sort of back then your career and the, the, my sort of standard interview. So I want to do something slightly different today. And I want to start, what do you, how do you define seamanship? 
Well, <clears throat> there's no question a lot of it comes from um, classroom stuff, reading material, but none of it is successful until you actually experience it. Uh, and there's a quality of, there's a, a splitting of hairs with the word seamanship in the sense that there are categories. You've got piloting, you've got celestial navigation, um, you've got um, a handling of sail gear, you've got vessel preparation, and then what's your fallback when things go a little haywire. And, of course, the extensiveness of any particular activity has a lot to deal with. Uh, 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 to that. So we here on Pride have noted where crew members coming from other vessels, because we always hire from other within the community of what is tall ships, what is sail training, um, whereby they get to know the boat more often than not before we go to sea. And that's a pretty steep learning curve. But then it's a whole new world at sea. When we're going 24-7, and you've got whatever the conditions are out there. And no matter how often one might explain a technique, when, it cha when the motion changes dramatically, when the power in the sail changes dramatically from whatever has been experienced before, that's so new that the business of seamanship really doesn't exist. They don't have any background. With, even with the background they have, they don't have the background. So uh, in terms of Pride of Baltimore, what the captains are challenged with is this steady recognition of this fact. Because if we assume too much about what their experience is, we can ask for something to happen that is with no preparation, and they can get into trouble. A simple example would be um, uh, understanding how important it is to keep a sail from flogging. Mm -hmm. uh, our gear is so heavy that it'll destroy itself, assuming nobody's in the way. So we have <laughs> yeah. a financial issue there and a general ability to keep sailing issue there. But then, of course, it's injury risk. And that's common sense. Well, where do you get the common sense? Well, you have to go do it because no matter how much you've read about it or heard about it, you still have to have done it. So seamanship, good seamanship, requires time doing it. And that's in this fast-paced world and this business of everything kind of is an adventure and why not until you really have to do the paying of the bills and the what have you. And sometimes you can do this and do that, but real seamanship is accumulation of experience. So I'm curious, I, I'm going to tell you how I've very distinctly boiled it down, and I'm curious to see what you, how you react to this. So I've said that seamanship is about anticipation and about adaptability. And I would say that the anticipation part of it can be, can be learned to an extent, but then the adaptability part, you have to earn that because you can't, like, you can anticipate, you can know how to run all through all the things, you can know that in your head, but then when things don't go as they went in the book, that's when you have to adapt. And you can't learn to adapt until you're doing it in the field. And that succinct story is a demonstration of what I am not, is a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it's... I show and I explain and I tell at the time of the moment, but then everything else is that latter part. It's that that experience to the business of adapt to in order to have the ability to make those adaptions. So when you're on the ship, like on our boats, we're sort of on like in the same area. In that, when a crew's doing something, if they're doing it wrong, things are happening close enough that I could step in. I say crew because our paying crew are also sailing the boat. I can step in and correct that, whereas you can't. So how is that different? Like, how do you lead differently when you can't actually step in? You got a guy up the rig, for example, and and you're giving orders. How does that chain of command work, and how do you how do you manage that differently than you would on a smaller boat? Well, with new crew members or any crew members that are coming back from previous vessels, having been here before that, there is this business of pace. So. Um, uh, a rubric 
uh, 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 maybe it's a limerick I say to myself is, is you know, <clears throat> no matter who your crew is, it's the captain's responsibility to give them the time. If they run out of time, that's your problem, not their problem. So like any of the bigger vessels, particularly uh, 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 because they're moving more slowly as a general rule, there is a conversation. And sometimes it's a pretty simple one whereby the watch leader is reminded by the captain, make sure you cover these things, these elements, before you we execute. Going aloft is another matter based on sea conditions. Sometimes it's a very routine scenario, but often enough it isn't. So you have to say, wait a minute, it's all voluntary. Is there a comfort value that is acceptable? Um, and it's not a matter of, of, of um, who's a better sailor. It's really a very personal story. And it goes back to this business of adaptability. What's been the basis for the experience so that when it's a new situation, they're able to, to fathom where their adaptability is going to have to occur. And the captain will interrupt that whole process. It won't just say, go do it. We'll notice the difference between what is routine and what is not routine, and we'll discuss it. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 the whole process is leading through anticipation by the captain so that they can describe what to look out for. But then we stop teaching it because if they've done it once, we don't expect them to forget it. And that <laughs> yeah. can be a real problem because frequently they often do. How often do you have to stay sort of fit like do you do you go up the rig do you still do the things that you ask of the crew no um <clears throat> while uh i can go up the rig it's been a long time and i have to be careful of my own management because that's one of the things we also police with the crew is what is your confidence why are you confident and do you understand what our policies are and what the arrangement is for for what is the safety fallback arrangements. Um, every ship is different. It's not standard. Um, so, um, uh, but in terms of staying fit, I do work at it at home, but not for the idea that I'm going to climb. Yeah. My job is to have the overview or the captain's job is to have the omniscient view as much as can be created so that the, the information at a detail level is relevant to the bigger picture. And can you describe, like, when you're at sea, so offshore on a passage running a watch schedule 24-7, what does a typical 24-hour period look like for you and then how the rest of the crew works under you? What's the hierarchy and how does that work? Well, the captains of pride are always available. They don't stand a watch. For the mates, a tradition in big shipping is, is they actually take command in a sense for their watch period. We don't do that here. We say you're taking the con and you're our lookout. You're our information center to keep the captains advised. What does that mean, taking the con? Does, is con short for something? It's, it is. It's, I think it's, it's, well, actually, I'm not certain. Um, con is more like piloting. It's yeah. just plain driving, uh, uh, managing the moment to moment. Yep. But you are in a hierarchy position to keep up with your helmsman as a separate person or your lookouts as separate individuals they would refer to you and then you would refer to the next person up. Um, so in our case, the watch leaders keep an eye on what's going on and then inform the captain of any changes that appear to be relevant. How do you define that? How do you well, define a relevant under, change? And under, do, you, do you define it? Oh, yeah. I, I, it's instantly updated all the time. So uh, change of the watch. The watch... Watches don't change without a consultation with the captain. What do you mean the watches don't change? Like the from from period of time noon to four p.m. or sixteen hundred. At sixteen hundred, the watch leaders change. The watch teams change. And then you're and you're and always aware two, of what's going on. They come down, okay, and they report in before the actual handoff occurs. So and a conversation might be. Um, or starts off with the oncoming mate, watch leader, describing what they understand of the situation as directly observed, 
prior to coming down <clears throat> uh, and been told by the um, relieving, uh, the, the watch leader they're relieving. Then that opens up an opportunity for the captain to, to remind of certain things that are in the captain's mind as to being, you know, reinforcing things or, 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 uh, or just acknowledging. Um, and so we're always available. And the reason this is going this way is the power of the boat under sail, the power of the boat. The secondary part of it is <clears throat> the, the, um, the business of, of approaching speeds. Um, navigating, or rather piloting in the Chesapeake Bay or in, in narrow waters with a lot of commercial traffic that might be relatively small here in the Bay, as you know. There's a north-south traffic that's pretty regular with relatively shallow draft vessels that's all commercial. And we also have a very fast, relatively fast, twice as fast, if not three times as fast, up to 20 knots and plus uh, in the deep water part. So that whole business of of uh, what is lookout? Well, today with AIS, lookout's a lot further than visibility most of the time. Mm. And so we get an early one, but are they actually looking at that? And so we duplicate our readouts in the, in, uh, in the captain's area so that there's bridge resource management from down below as well as from on deck. And the watch change or any change is a consultation. Bridge resource management, it's a team a team thinking thing and we do not actually transfer the command we only have different watch leaders taking the con and they manage based on the descriptions of the captain's interests so that bridge resource management we talk about that a lot where you the idea being again if i can summarize the way i think of it is when if i ask you to do something and you, you like people are obligated to give their opinions yet it's still the captain's responsibility to make the decisions yes absolutely um <clears throat> the uh, uh, and, and this whole business of what is um uh transference of authority has a lot to do with knowledge so for instance some vessels can't afford to have a watch leading captain and a watch lead, uh, and other two leaders who actually take command for the period, so now, responsible captains that. on the ship at in the, the same in time. In the sense of what is the knowledge base? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is true in recreation boating of 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 serious voyaging circumstances, uh, uh, in semi professional stuff. Uh, it's more mandated at the more of the commercial level, and largely because of tradition on the ocean blue water boats. But here in the states, the captaincy of towboats is structured as a two operator scenario and their tradition they developed a tradition under that legal responsibility of minimum manning hmm. is to do six on and six off which of course means what you got to go you you, uh, you got to change clothes you got to eat what have you and also there are no professional cook on board they're cooking for themselves so what does that amount it probably amounts to four hours of downtime and then there's another six hours on, which is really eight, seven to eight. And that's a cycle, and that's regulated that way for minimum manning requirements. Um, and I'm not complaining about it because I don't do it, but yeah. I also am sympathetic to it as to what those demands are and what the surrender is. And then you get the liability story in the oil world, which is one of them senior. One of them is the captain, at least within the context of, of, of the operation. But that's a standing watch. So they have to have rest. So that means yeah. you're actually centering it, and there's the trust factor there. So that's an interesting world that I haven't I've read about, but I haven't. I, I was going to ask: part. Have you always been in the sailing ship world, or have you? Did you branch out into yeah. other stuff? No, it's um, um, a, 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 a cruising, classic yachting cruising father. Um, I got into uh, uh, paid work as a sail training officer on a small schooner, the schooner bringing it out of Mystic for some years. Got to know classic yachting on the one side and got to know the, 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 the passenger traditional windjammer stuff like Bill of Rights and Shenandoah, at least around peripherally. Uh, and then um, kept in, in more of the heavy displacement. So I was a mate with the Bill of Rights. I became a mate aboard a small square rigger called the American square rigger called uh, the uh, Unicorn. Um, 
and then Wait, went the command. Uni unicorn. Not the steel one. The wooden one that was down in St. Lucia for a long, long time. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, it used to she yeah, was I a, was like, I know that ship. Yeah, she she came across. Didn't they use that for a movie at some point? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, She's originally a, um, <clears throat> um, a Scandinavian stone-carrying schooner um, out of Finland, post-World War II. Somebody out of Germany thought it'd be a cool idea to turn her into a, um, um, a, a passenger-type boat. Didn't understand coming to the United States as a foreign vessel. That wasn't ever going to happen. Wound up in the Caribbean. But then an American bought her, and preparatory to 1976, turned her into an American passenger-carrying vessel, Coast Guard regulated as a full brig. Hmm. And some couple of three years later, I got a chance to go aboard as a mate for a year. But then my command st uh, history started, and I was on a fair cement schooner, delivery down to the Caribbean, windjammer stuff in the American and British Virgin Islands for a couple of winters. I got aboard the Pride of Baltimore. So it's always been sail. Hmm. Always been sail. A little bit of pinch hitting with a river boat up in the Connecticut River for a weekend here or a weekend <laughs> there because they needed the license and yeah yeah and, yeah. Uh, so so how do you? I asked you a few weeks ago. Like I, it's been a while since we started our business that I've sailed sort of as an apprentice or under someone else. And I asked you, hey, I'd like to come on Pride sometime and just see how you do it. How do you keep yourself con continuing education? How do you stay fresh? on the knowledge side of things and learn new things and not, not get complacent. Cause I think like the danger to seamanship, like that it, it's complacency. You get, you do the same thing for a long time. You've been with pride for how many years now? <laughs> no, I'm serious. How many, how it's been, I mean, well, this as long boat, as I've known this, pride. Yeah. Been right. Here. This vessel started sailing in the fall of 88. So I came on as the first of a two captain program. Uh, so I've been with her ever since. And I had time with the other boat a number of times as skipper starting as early as 81 and boats in between so, so how do you avoid that complacency where it's it's become second nature and yet you still have to stay aware of things well i think it's my nature as against maybe everybody's nature is is that i am engaged with what i want to know and not be surprised by when i'm in a position i'm not being able to do anything else about it so vessel preparation, I have been nose to the grindstone of wanting to know every detail, understanding a choice between this and that, making that choice. Um, so from an electronic navigation point of view, uh, from a what is it we need to carry in extra uh, for long voyage maintenance, long periods of time away from home maintenance, what I'm expecting out of the crew. The whole process is my life is affected by the lack of preparation or a lack of anticipation. So over the years, decades, um, as an internationally licensed requirement by Coast Guard for even a vessel this small, you have to be 500 ton. So <clears throat> that requires STCW oversight on top when you're making an international voyage. Yep. So that some of those courses are every five years. More of them are once in a career. Um, and so my investment in my life at sea drives what it is I keep an eye on. So from a point of view of being a relatively small boat going in the ocean and making long voyages, what are the the uh, modern communications opportunities there. We, we do life cycle some of our equipment in terms of navigation. So um, that's a conversation I have with technical people, people who know what the difference is between dependability or a little bit of glitch. You know, mm -hmm. I can remember when the early days of Captain and, and, and uh, another uh, Noble Tech where that big conversation was, well, Noble Tech comes from people who are part of Microsoft, whereas Captain not. And what's the difference in glitch? Now, if you cataloged it all up, it'd probably be 50%, 50% evenly divided of opinion, of facts, defending yeah, yeah. opinion. But, that, you know, you, you get into those weeds. And that's all. And then weather, watching what's going on with weather, mostly from the point of view of parsing how they describe it. I'm not a weather person. I am interested in what do they actually mean and how does that affect me? And there's a different language when it's written 
for the land, land person here in the United States than it is written to the coastal Ameri uh, sailor. And then you get, as the advancement of GRIBS are coming along, and now we have quite a lot of access through the satellite communications that we're able to, not very expensive, but means we have unlimited access to GRIBS, is okay, that's a whole new language of, mm. of, of graphics, trying to understand yep. the different models and what have you. Uh, so, um, and then the limitation, we teach this too. We, we, we actually, when, when we teach weather before passage, you look at the GRIB and then you look at a forecast because you get a marine forecast. There's a skill in interpreting that. And then, you, so I teach it. You look at the grib, you look at the forecast, you read it line by line, and all you're doing is translating the sentences into the visualization and, and seeing that. But there's like a skill to that. So my first introduction to what is weather, of course, is the Coast Guard license, and I'm 18 years old because that's the earliest I could do that kind of licensing. Over time, long before I ever got involved with, the, uh, with, with, with um, licensed commercial vessels going across bodies of water, I got involved with studying weather on my own, so textbooks. Then I went to a couple of sen seminars. I haven't done that in a long time because that background has informed me as to the kinds of things that I will ask myself that I don't understand and figure out how to interpret it. And still there's this puzzle palace because, as you saw, as the, 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 um, the uh, uh, graphic weather picture, which we're all familiar with, particularly with facsimile, um, is layered. So you have to superimpose in your mind, sometimes picture to picture, but still in your mind you're making it. Well, the GRIBS can produce a lot of information all at the same time. Mm. And that takes learning. It's just figuring out what do they really mean and how does that affect us. And then recognizing that the absolutism of forecasts is just not there. I hate that. I actually, so we use a company called Weather Routing Inc. to do our weather routing. And I, it's a constant battle with them. You guys, you write it as if it is like set in stone. This, this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen. And actually what I think the most useful thing is you want to know a degree of certainty. Okay, we think this will happen and we're very confident versus we, the, you know, the models are very uncertain. So Because I think that's for ocean sailing especially. The level of certainty is, is almost more important than what is the most important thing. How, how certain are we this can happen? Because... As the uncertainty increases, the more uncertain it is, the more conservative you might make your decisions. So of the last, I don't know, five or more years, but notably more in the last five years, the difference of the sense of, of, of what is seamanship when it comes to looking out for weather seems to be a little bit less of interest than it has been in the past. So... Crew members will ask me, how do you know by looking at that? But that's been happening less. I don't know what's causing that. Wait, what's been happening less? That they're, not a they're asking, okay. how do you read the sky? Oh, actually, just look out the window. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, uh, and a number of times, even way, way back then when it was a question, the surprise when I've been able to tell something's going to happen and nobody else is, and, they're, and I'm saying shorten this down, shorten that down, do this, do that, and then we get the event. And they look back at me, usually they don't say anything, but every once in a while somebody who's sort of idealistic would say, how did you figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it's the, and so that study process for me started with those textbooks and those photographs of what was the sky and what was this. And then, of course, a lot of sail time. Uh, yeah, just being well, out there. That's yeah. What you said before about that just it just takes time. And we, Shia is sitting here in the background, uh, filming this for us, and she's uh, worked as an apprentice for us this year. And you you think of the traditional idea of an apprenticeship was many years of doing this, the repetitiveness, the same thing. And that's where that's how you really learn. And I think that's the only way to, especially in this context, you just have to do it over and over and over again. Well, in and, and under under guidance, like not just figuring out as you go. Right. And and there's more than one transportation medium that has that challenge when it comes to the cost of training people up. Yeah. Flying is one. Right. Um, the um, the merchant marine is another um, <clears throat> in the sense that the effort is to reduce that cost. Mm. What does that mean? Well, in the long run, they're talking about automating the big ships. <laughs> Nobody on board at all. Yeah. So, so right. I mean, you go. We, we, I'm living in Sweden. You no, go to Norway. They already have that. Already exists. There's yeah. Several just yeah. uncrewed ships. Yeah. So, so, so I wonder 
wonder what that filter learning ratio is when it's remote observed. Mm. What's the what's the keeping an eye on demand for knowledge and what type of knowledge and what type of training to sort of understand that the automatics are doing what they're meant to do, but it's not meeting the occasion or 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 knowing that it's not meant to do this in this situation, this and how to intercede. That's really that's I mean that's a whole other level of how do you think about this stuff. But going back to the apprenticeship thing in this context, you have the the cost of training when you're trying to train someone up, but also the cost from the the apprentice's perspective of the time it takes to get, you know, it's a long road. And it's not, you know, like you, you said at the beginning of this, everything happens so fast and fast paced and stuff. It's one of those things you can't just you, you have to, it has to take the time it takes. You can't accelerate it because you have to be put in these different situations. Well, I've I've found myself dancing between being a little bit angry and just smiling ruefully to myself when somebody comes up to me. And this has happened for over 30 years. Once in a while. <sighs> oh, I, I want to I want to be a captain just like you. How do I do it? <laughs> I shake my head mentally and just said, well, you just got to put the time in. Put the time in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, all right, so switching gears a little bit. Um, last time I saw you guys, I think you, I don't know if you were on board, but I'll describe the situation. I want you to describe to me how that would play out. We were in Lunenburg on one of our boats in 2019, I think, and you guys were there the same time. And you had parked on one of the wharfs at the, at the town and you had the bow facing out and you, it was a beautiful day. You guys were getting ready to leave and I was watching and it was clear that you were going to attempt to sail off the dock because the wind was coming off the land and like on a ship this big, like that is just like the coolest thing ever. And then we got our horn going, you guys fired the cannon at the town and, but you, you did it. Like you can see the crew up the rig. It's like, Oh man, they're going to sail off the dock. How do you decide a, you're going to do that. And B, what is the process on board when you're like prepping for that? How, like, what what is the routine for making something like that happen? Because that's kind of like, I mean, it's good seamanship, but it's also you guys are putting on a show for the town because the whole town was there to watch. Yeah, so there's a bit of a yin and a yang. You know, I'm driven to sail, um, but I'm also in a public relations kind of thing. Mm. So where's the pride? Is the pride about obligation or the, the, the showing off is about obligation or is it personally driven? And I'm more on the personally driven. I just like doing that. Um, now, feasibility? Sailing off a dock is one hell of a lot simpler than sailing onto a dock. <laughs> true, true. I liken it to you're hanging off a bar and all you do is let go and gravity takes over. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a sailboat, it's understanding what direction gravity is going to take you, i.e. the wind. Because you're going to be nothing but a bit of flotsam with windage until you get way. So understanding the amount of time it's likely to take for the given wind force for the amount of sail and where the sail is relative to the center of the vessel in combination to how the vessel's tied up and how the wind's coming across the dock and then how much you have downwind that you have to be mindful of shoal water, other uh, uh, realities. So it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's almost like the old Boy Scout trick of where's the wind coming from wet your finger and put your finger up. It's, you think you know where it is and this is a way of verifying. So in my case, in that situation, um, you had to be mindful of the hill of Lunenburg in the sense that sometimes under certain circumstances, a wind coming from offshore will switch 50 degrees, which could be the difference of putting you on the dock or not making the turn viable. And of course, as a schooner, her biggest sail is way back aft. And if we're stern into the wind, that's not the first sail you're going to set because you need to enhance acceleration without twisting the balance of the vessel up that she turns before she moves ahead. So all this calculus goes into play. Um, and, and, it's a, and it's a construct uh, in the sense that when you figure out where you want your center of effort, uh, which is a height as well as a fore and aft scenario with this boat, 
it's and it plays very flexibly so that's a puzzle it's not we it's not like you only have two sales to work with right and so you got two masks and a bunch of sales and you got squares and so you you work that out in your head and then based on the turning radius situation the likelihood of acceleration and when the rudder is going to start to respond um, um and so you play to that progression so it's always with this and then this, it will only enhance. It will only cooperate. It won't argue against the effort. Um, so biggest bold uh, example of a gross egregiousness about, the ba- uh, about that assembly of progressiveness is as we get going and the wind's aft, but we set the main for them because we'd immediately lose the ability of the rudder to do what it's doing unless the boat's going real fast. So that's that logic stream. You get to know your boat. You evaluate the harbor. Coming up to a dock, I had the wonderful opportunity, and it was not something I anticipated, of being in Lunenburg for a few days and taking a number as guests, a number of folks for sale, and some pretty salty folks. Dan Morland was on board, a number of his associates over the years. And we went out for a sail, and we came back in again, and there's onshore breeze. And we were to sail all the way up to where the Blue Nose docks and round up into the wind and stop her ahead, just in alignment to settle back. But I used the engines then, and I made the point that at this point, probably in a fishing schooner wanted to do just what we were doing, it'd probably drop a hook or drag a hook and let her settle back and we could sail into the dock. We didn't do that. We got close and motored back, but the whole evolution of how much sail we had up when we're tacking around out there on the rocks and then broad reaching back and then working out the deceleration. Again, it's about the balance and what are we going to do? Well, it kept the main up because it's a great way to turn the boat. Mm. And then also it's a great way to stop the boat turning because you use a quarter takeoff on the boom put it on the lee side, shorten it real, 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 real tight so that when the vessel passes through the eye of the wind, the main goes aback and she, with the rudder one way and the main the other, the air rudder the other, she stops within a boat length, no matter how fast you're going. And if you're going real slow, if the wind dies, no, you don't stop because then her mass keeps going. But anyhow, these are things that you, that provide a lot of flexibility, like stopping the boat. I had a tacking situation just outside of Key Bridge. Westerly breeze, pretty puffy. We got to the downwind side of the key bridge, so we're working now we're working our way back into the wind. And I wanted to make a turn attack from the south shore to then head up going through the main gate on a port tack when a puff came from just south of west or just west. And with her Ratio, which is 157 a four and a half rig with only 100 feet of height above the deck from tack to up, low aspect ratio. That pressure hit the bow of the jibs first before it balanced out the rest of the boat. Okay. I couldn't turn the boat. Hmm. So I'm running into shoal water. So we square the topsail. I say, don't, I, we, she won't turn. So I just say, go square. So the topsail's up, braced up for a starboard tack. Go square. She stops, starts to back up, and then falls and does a total 180 degrees and sail ack out of it, get going again, get back in again. And just because of that puff cycle, um, the first time we couldn't do it. The second time it was straightforward. So how much all that stuff, how important is it that the crew understand that big picture and how all this interacts versus just do pull that line and do this like how how much do you want the crew to be in in tune with the big picture i liken it to the business of of what i imagine not being a musician what a symphonic scenario is the conductor assumes you know how to play your instrument you're just waiting for the timing so in those tight conditions the crew know how to handle each particular sail unless it's a really crazy scenario. If it's a standard scenario, you need to change it because, like I just described, the puff of wind, then all they're doing is waiting for the call. Now, they were expecting the boat to turn, expecting me to say heartily or helmsily, uh, and then at some point let go, which is code for all those things they're going to do to complete to start to complete the tack. Instead, out of the blue, I say, 
square the topsoil, only square the topsoil. So they might look puzzled. They might think, like, whoa, what's going on? Because they're not seeing the bigger picture, unless maybe the mate is. I mean, the mate was very experienced at the time, and he probably added it up as quickly as I did, or very shortly thereafter. I'm doing the steering, so I saw the bow not be able to respond to my movement of the rudder you because of the puff. On or you I were hands-on? I was hands-on. Okay. No, I was hands-on. Yep. Uh, in close-order situations, what I have found is, is the manpower requirements of this powerful boat means that if I take the helm, then I got a lot more power up forward. To do other things, yeah. I drop it by 15, 20% if I'm not doing anything at sure. all. So, <clears throat> so when I called that specific order, nothing else happened but that. And they knew how to do that. It might have been strange to them. And then later I could explain to them what happened was just, you just wouldn't turn because this puff starts at the bow. So you debrief it. Yeah. 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 So when you're in that situation of sailing off the dock, I mean, you you get excited about that. Does the crew? Oh yeah, absolutely. Do they know? They they must know well, I, your I tendencies. Them. Oh no, I prep them. Do you think they know? Like, okay, today's the day. Like, John's every once in a sail while, off the dock. yeah. Every once in a while, uh, uh, folks that have been aboard for a while, even if it's their first year with the boat, they'll they'll add up from their previous experience with other vessels. They'll, they might jump to, uh, hmm, I wonder what he's going to do. And yes, captains have personality traits. Yeah. And so they, they, there may have been some events that happened earlier in the season that tipped somebody else off on their own to say, I wonder if he's going to do that. Um, sometimes it's because the town is a sailor town, and they'll ask, are you going to sail off the dock? Well, that's like Lunenburg, I mean, is yeah. the classic yeah. version yeah. of So that. from a crew point of view, they may have been sort of queued up by somebody else who happens to know this world and yeah. that geography and the wind direction at the time. But more often I'm saying, okay, everybody, this is what we're going to do. And this is why I think we can do it. And, and they get excited and why not? <laughs> That's so cool. I love, I just love that you, that the, you know, I think it's unexpected on a big ship, especially a commercial ship like this. Cause you've got responsibilities. Like you, you have a boss. It's not your boat, right? So like you, you, you can't just be doing cowboy stuff. You have to make sure it, you're not gonna. You're not gonna break well, it. Well, there is no question throughout my life and what I've read and 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 other conversations is the young and hungry and the pro and the tendency to show off perspective and what do they know for that? And then the vice versa side of it is okay. There goes Jan. He's being dangerous again because their mindset, their whole sense of responsibility is so so. M- uh, managed by the business of what is caution for the reasons of what is risk and in, in their in their particular way of evaluating it. So there's another little quip. It says, don't do anything you're not comfortable with. If you're not comfortable doing what I do, this is best for the other captain, you don't do it. You're not here to sail the boat the way I sail the boat. You're here to understand the boat. And do the mission as best you can, but don't operate outside of your comfort zone. And there's a learning process with this vessel. Um, and so what's unfair is I've got how many years ahead of any new captain. And now, Captain Crosby, a partner captain, has been so for two years. He was a mate with us for several years before that. <clears throat> that whole progression is been going on in a very steady sort of way. And, and, and so uh, I don't know when I said it, but I said it a long time ago with him. Is you just don't do anything you're not comfortable with. Yeah, that's good advice because, yeah, I like that. Because you, if you're using somebody else's style and it's not your own, that's where the risk is. That's where the risk goes sky high. That's, that's super interesting. I also think you, you said like what some people consider showing off is is routine sometimes and can be i mean a lot of things are actually easier i'm not talking about a ship like this but every boat has a personality and some things are actually easier to do under sail than they are under power when there's wind or especially waves because the sails are part of the design of the boat the boat's designed to sail not to motor well there's a lot in this modern world there's a lot of this business of what is the thought uh, well, what is being thought was, what is tradition? Or rather, what was the way they used to do it? Yeah. Meanwhile, we have also programs that are on the water about teaching. 
Now, you can't do anything fast teaching-wise without a lot of buildup. So most of the time, they're doing it one step at a time. And I have been many, 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 many times reminding the crew here is, is we are not a sail training boat. We'll show you how it works, but you got to study how it works because we don't have any time built in to do one step at a time. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is, is purpose. Sail training, taking young people or any age range that's never done it before and putting them inside this machinery. This is an engine. This is a powerful engine, the more powerful than the mechanic, internal combustion machine, which you can't be in when it's running anyway. So, <laughs> no, you're inside a big architecture of parts that are apt to move, apt to stretch, possibly flog. You have to have your head about you so you don't get hurt. Now, different scales, different purposes. In recreational settings, sporting regula uh, 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 activities, there's, they're going to be that frame of reference. And as long as all these judgments are within that frame of reference, then it's applicable, whether it's bold or conservative. Mm. So in the case of Pride, we're small enough we have a lot of redundancy with regards to twin engine. We have a very capable uh, vessel in terms of once you understand its center of efforts and its rig geometry and its sail handling with regards to that, it, it just, it's, these are things you use as your toolkit. They're like, I use the analogy sometimes of, of a 15 or 18 gear truck hauler, long hauler. When they're empty, how many gears are they going through? Mm. They're skipping a bunch of gears. Well, Pride probably could be called as an 18-gear vessel. And we're skipping a lot. I mean, how often do we start setting sail with the foresail being the first sail? It's almost 90% of the time. We're not going with the mainsail first. We do occasionally, but not generally. How long does it take to set all the sail on this boat from, from a... With, with a crew that is got experience, we can get it all up, including the main gap topsail and the three headsails in 20 minutes. Wow. How many crew? We, that's all hands. So we hire for a full crew of, of 12 on board. So that's the captain, uh, uh, three watch leaders, uh, six deckhands, cook... Seven deckhands because we have an engineer mm. deckhand. So we're all together 12. So when, when the, and the cook and the captain are not part of the yep. activity. So the captain's driving. There are 10 people pulling strings. Uh, uh, and the cook is welcome if they want to. So we can get it done in 20 minutes. Is the cook also a sailor? Uh, in the sense of cooking, more often than not, but not always. Yeah. In terms of being a deckhand, no, they don't have to be at all. Mm. But if they want to be a participant, they're fully welcome. Mm. And, we, and, we, and we work on that basis of what they think they know. It's always voluntary what they're confident in. We don't force anything. The only thing that they're really responsible for on our structure is our, is our emergency response system. So if we had a person overboard, there's a role for them. Sure. They start making hot water and getting other stuff and doing a head count and that sort of stuff. So we have emergency station bill stuff that they are part of. When you're handing over to another captain, how is the continuity managed and is there someone above you guys that is overseeing that continuity? No, we partner captains are the management for the operations or or, or the marine side of the equation. So <clears throat> Um, uh, because Captain Crosby's come up as being a mate, um, it's not sudden. He's been around the boat a long time. He wants to stay with the boat. He likes what's going on here, likes the way the operation works, and he feels he can contribute to it. So that positivity means the conversations started a long time ago. Way long time ago. He first came back as, as, as mate in 2016. So he's been with us most of the time, all that time. So that, that conversation that might be sort of sudden with a new to the ship, new to the company captain is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very slow ramp, very steady ramp. Now, when I've had partner captain changeover, 
and they become an employee and they stay with the company both when they're ashore and when they're not uh, are not ashore. We trade off as shore captain for each other, as fallback captain, along with advisories to the office for wrinkles of circumstances when the at-sea captain can't be communicated with or the timeline of response time zones that sort of stuff get in the way so it's not like you're going when you go home it's not like you're just checking out and and no. not thinking about both it captains earn their compensatory time for the fact that they haven't had regular time off while they're in command when the ship is out of town is accumulated and that gets used but it's always on an on-call basis for any kind of emergency so even when you're off you're on call mm-hmm. yeah yeah and and from the point of view of managing the mission which is can be very creative from a land perspective and think this is genius. You have to sort of help them understand when it's okay and when it's, well, we got to trim this back or we have to say no to this element, but we can do it same thing in a different way because water's not deep enough or the water's not wide enough or any number of factors that their imagining of what could be a great show now, our job is to make their mission successful. What is the what is the overall mission of Pride? It's to uh, <clears throat> it's it's to tell the story of Maryland, uh, never embarrass Maryland. So it's a high marketing concept. Now there's a genesis to this too. I mean, the city of Baltimore ordered a boat to be built. What city in America builds a wooden sailboat? <laughs> and then later on, ten years later. What state in the country replaces a wooden sailboat? So we have a genesis that is not well planned out by the city, except for one vision. Let's recall our Baltimore Clipper privateer 1812 war heritage, do a replica, put it in the harbor, and change hearts and minds because they were re-cleaning up the inner harbor. And and the mayor of the day and the this city, is in the, like the early eighties. This is no, this is in the mid seventies. Seventies, okay. So the whole inner harbor story was being cleaned out of old infrastructure, which used to be wooden boat steamers, wooden boat oyster boats, and cetera, and all that infrastructure, uh, docking wise, was being torn out. It was all cleaned up. Then what do you do with the land? Well, they're turning it into recreation, public recreation. So the pavilions were being built. And the effort to make the general public aware was a matter of what was public relations. What could catch their interest? And somebody recommended, remember your 1812 history, and the fort's not good enough. You got to do this. And they had a painting of the day of a privateer, and everybody had the same agreement all at the same time. So they put out an RFP. The city of Baltimore put out an RFP, and five people proposed proposals. One of them was chosen. It was a group out of Annapolis with Tom Gilmer and Melbourne Smith and Fred Hecklinger, and, and they did it. It was meant to sit in the harbor just to be pretty. Oh, wow. But during construction, which happened to be 1976, International square riggers were passing through Baltimore and, the, and other vessels, and the foreign crews were saying, is this going to be, because the boat was being built in public view right near the Maryland Science Center, is this going to be your ambassador? Well, the mayor of the day, a fellow famous, Schaefer, he's quite the cheerleader politician. He said, wow, really? Can you sail this boat? The builders, <laughs> of course, were all of the same voice. Of course we can sail this boat. And one thing leads to another, and newspapers in Baltimore were writing about newspapers talking about the Pride of Baltimore that were newspapers in landlocked cities talking about the Pride of Baltimore in a port city, not in Maryland, somewhere else. So there's this wonderful feedback loop of, I'm a Baltimorean, I'm a Marylander, I'm proud of our maritime history, our boat is over there. So it expands on that. So at the loss of the second vessel, first vessel, who would have thought that the general public, far and wide, internationally, nationally, statewide, and locally, would have a collective sentiment that was so powerful it would encourage city politicians and state politicians to let's build another boat? 
the second chance meant that we could design it purposely for the mission because it wasn't the original right, wasn't was going to go be, be a, ambassador a anywhere piece, yeah. to a showpiece huh. and we converted uh, uh, the crews converted the old boat into a good sea boat but her you know, 80 feet long and low freeboard she's just not that powerful an ocean going thing and so we had to manage her very carefully Armin Assessor and Peter Bedro and myself were the only skippers from 1980 through her loss and we had a lot of mind uh, 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 similar minded attitudes about preparing the boat and so when she went to Europe she was as good as she was ever going to be now could she capsize yeah she could have capsized here in the harbor with a big wind I mean it's it's how dangerous was it well the measurement is is that she could have sustained an angle of 80 degrees before falling hmm. so we see that out in the ocean in a variety of ways it wasn't a passenger carrier all the crew were professional all crew were paid all the crew were trained so <clears throat> The business of vulnerability is a business, a matter of scale. She didn't hit anything. She didn't go aground. She was in the middle of open water, 100% cloud cover. No way to know visually in the middle of the day that there was a cumulonimbus and not an ordinary one. If anybody studies microburst, they'll understand that it's a cumulonimbus phenomenon of majestic proportions. And National Weather Service called the Coast Guard up and said, we want to be a witness at the hearing of the loss of the Pride of Baltimore. One federal agency telling another federal agency is getting ready to trial for the tragedy. I want to be a witness. That changed the entire inflection of the conversation. Why do you want to be a witness? Because we need to share what we know about microbursts. The photographs from satellite of the day, of the time, what we've read from the survivors' descriptions, um, knowing the position of the boat, that was a microburst. Well, what's a microburst? So this whole thing went from there. And the thing about it today is with radar, we can see water suspended. We can't tell that it's going to be a squall, right. but we can sort of hazard some assumptions that either give us a sense of non-threat, or, but awareness, or maybe, hey, this, is, this could be something. She wasn't with a radar. In broad daylight, I say overcast daylight, 100% cloud cover with no differential to the grayness, and then this thing hits them, the minimum speed estimated to tip the boat over with that sail area that she had was not less than 70 mile an hour winds. Wow. And it happened like that. Guess what the range of speed for a microburst is? 50 to 200 miles an hour. We don't know what the gust was. Mm. It wasn't less than 70. And the description of the survivors is the boat just went flat in the water. I mean, it might have taken 20 seconds, but it went flat in the water. And by my understanding, my call of the testimony, it wasn't 10, 20 seconds. It was more like it went over. Mm. So what could happen with a boat like this? Well, 70 knots would have scared the hell out of us. But with watertight bulkheads. But what happens if it were 150 knots? Mm. Boom. With a double reef main and a staysail. Well, I suppose the salty ones would say blow the sail out. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. But we got a lot of windage in the rig. What's the chances of this being pretty flat in the water with that kind of a gust? Now, would that sink the boat? Again, watertight bulkheads, a variety of other things. The scale of the boat, the size of the boat. How big is Pride 2? We're um, uh, 80. Oh, sorry. We're 100 on the rail. Okay. Uh, we're 91 in the water, and we're 26 of beam, and we're 12 and a half of draft, and she weighs over 400,000 pounds. Jesus. The old boat wow. was, roughly speaking, 20% smaller in dimension, but that reduced her net, her tonnage, her gross tonnage down, th- I mean, I spoke in pounds, but that's two, 185 long tons, Versus 121 
on the old boat. Mm. So it's a much smaller boat. I mean, we didn't change the height of the mast. That uh, sail area lengths didn't change that much, but volumetrically, mm. we're a much more comfortable boat at, well, on the sea. On the topic of weather, we talked about this before. I forget his last name now. It's escaping me. But Elliot, Captain Elliot something, wrote a book recently called um, uh, um, Reading Glass. He's a tall ship's captain, works for the sea. Do, do you know who I'm talking about? Elliot Rappaport? Yes, thank you. Uh, one of our crew, Emma, sailed with him uh, as a student on uh, one of the, is it Seamester? C- yeah, or probably. C-C-S-E-A? He, yeah, and that would have been the Corey Kramer. It could have been the Seamans. Yeah, it was both. Well, he'd Kramer. sailed on both. But anyway, this book, um, have you read it? No. It is... Do you know Elliot? Uh, yeah, we've met a bunch of times. I haven't seen him in a long, long, long time. But th- because I'm, he was, or, or colleagues in a sense, in different yeah. business. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure he mentions Pride of Baltimore. I'm sure he mentions Pride of Baltimore, and I may even mention your name in the book. But it is the best book I've ever read on weather in the big picture and how to understand it. And it's filled with narratives and stuff. And it's just wonderful, wonderful. So I highly recommend his book. Sounds well, thank like you're you. into weather. Thank it's you. yeah. so good. Emma actually got got it for us for the for one of our boats and it, it is fantastic and he goes into the story of the microburst there's a whole big thing about the the bounty tragedy and and that whole thing but it's 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 the best book about weather and explaining it in like the big picture that i've ever read it's so good oh that's great no i'll, yeah. I'll grab it so jan um you're not even supposed to be here right now you're off duty right well only in the sense that i don't have responsibility for direct responsibility for the ship I have indirect responsibility to assist the captain, Captain Jeff Crosby, right now. Um, and so there are consultations that we do together. There are updates that we do together. There's collaborative conversation, particularly in today's world with the Chesapeake Bay so being cellularly covered um, mm. and access to Internet. There's some routine stuff that I don't wind up being tasked with because... They have communications, they can handle it. But then there are these group conversations. There's an all hands staff once a week, hour we spend together catching up with where we are, where we're going, where we're, uh, what have you. Then there's uh, uh, an only the office staff thing they do earlier in the week. And then there's just the captains and the executive director at the end of the week. So we're doing this regularly. And, and, and so my role is to as the short captain, is to be available to staff and be available to the ship. Um, and so that's mostly communication rather than something I'm doing. Yeah. But are you here officially now, or are you here because we're in the boat show and you're here because it's fun, or both? Well, no, there's a lot of show and tell. The whole business of, of, of being seen and seeing others. Mm. I mean, the boat show is built around that idea. It's a networking phenomenon, yeah. right? It's, it's, a, in, it's engineered as a networking thing. Very, very tricky, very, in terms of very subtle with a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, to have Pride be invited, what a wonderful way of re- reintroducing the vessel to others that may only see a pretty picture. Mm. Uh, to try to remind people this boat is not owned by the state of Maryland. It's not paid for by the state of Maryland. It's paid for by a nonprofit. The state used to own the boat. They gave it up back in 2010. Pride Inc. board decided that the best thing to do for the reputation of Maryland was to go ahead and try to shoulder the whole thing, and it's been a struggle ever since. Hmm. We do have support from the state through direct avenues. So we've gone in the last several years directly to the legislature and asked for a bill to, uh, to be able to present a bill for funding. And we have partial funding through the uh, acceptance, uh, through, through votes at the legislature. But it represents 35% of the annual budget. So wow. we're still lifting. The company is still lifting everything else. And the boat cannot earn it all on her own. Mm. She's not designed for that. I mean, woodwinds do a lot. But they're designed to, yeah. f- in a concept of understanding the neighborhood, choosing a design that, that is, 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 is not only attractive, adventurous, but easy by comparison. Yep. Uh, so um, it's no cha- it's an easy challenge. It's a lot of work, no question. But in the meantime, we have this heavier tonnage boat. It's oriented towards long distance voyaging and does it very well, continues to do it. So uh, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. 
And no, the state doesn't own the boat. Where's the next long voyage headed? When and when? Uh, well, actually, next year is sort of a low tempo year. So under the National Organization of Tall Ships America, which is a membership organization, nonprofit of of what is sail training interests, um, they speak to towns in local areas. So the Great Lakes is one area, the Gulf Coast is another area, the Atlantic is another area, the West Coast is another. And so far for the last several years, it's been a three-year cycle. Great Lakes one year, Gulf Coast the next year, Atlantic the next year. And so next year is going to be an Atlantic year. This okay. Earlier this year, we were in the Gulf of Mexico. We left in the middle of March and went down to Tampa, for St. Pete's Tall Ship Festival, then over to Galveston. Captains exchanged, and Jeff took the boat to... Um, <clears throat> uh, suddenly lost the name of it. Pensacola. Yep. And then and then, and then then drove the boat home. And then over the summer, he and I have traded places. We've been up to Cape Ann, been up to um, Portland. Uh, next year, because it's a bit of an off year, New England East Coast doesn't really have a passion for these tall ship festivals because the boats demand money to be there. Great Lakes has a big passion for it. So we're looking for 2025. So we don't know if we're going to be, well, certainly we're going to run the sail East Coast, but just how much of the East Coast will go to New England again, how much of it will do is... Um, is is unknown at this point. It's typical to not know exactly what we're doing in the off years um, uh, when it's uh, not otherwise obvious. So, uh, mm. um, um, but we're going to be taking the boat down to Savannah. This is Captain Crosby now. Greetings. <laughs> the, um, um, to Savannah for the winter to take okay. her out of the water so that shipwright... Captain Crosby can uh, replace some planks. Um, we found clues, early, early, early clues that um, the beginnings of a situation that over time will only get worse. So we're taking the opportunity. It could be as many as 20 planks um, replacing in white oak. Um, and so um, uh, then she'll come back during February to be ready to go again in March. Uh, God willing, and the creek don't rise. <laughs> well, Jan, this is great. Thanks again for having having me here. I hope to come sailing with you next year uh, if we can make that happen. I would really like that. I've never actually, as long as we've been circling around, I've been circling around Pride, I've never sailed on the ship. So let's make that happen. Yes, let's make that happen. Thanks again for a good chat. Uh-huh. Thanks again to Pelagic Autopilots for sponsoring this episode of the show. To spec your own system and learn more about their independent, robust, and redundant autopilots, go to pelagicautopilots.com. Thanks again to Dive Blue for presenting this episode of the podcast. Go to diveblue.com, that's D-I-V-E-B-L-U and the number three, to check out the Nemo and Nomad tankless dive systems and never hold your breath to fix a wrapped prop again. On the Wind is the podcast about sailing, created by 59 Degrees North and hosted by me, Andy Schell, and also by August Sandberg, Emma Garshagen, and occasionally Ben Doer. The show is mixed and produced in Frederick, Maryland by Lee Cumberland. Ads are read by us, the hosts, and occasionally by 59 North's bosun, Adam Brown, and podcast producer, Lee Cumberland. Episode artwork and website show notes are done by Laura Parent in San Francisco. The intro theme music is composed and performed by former podcast guest and musician Cameron Dale, while the outro music you're hearing now is, of course, by our friends, the Stormweather Shanty Choir. We love hearing from our fans, so send your questions and comments to holdfast at 59-north.com, and please do us a favor and review the show on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. Until next time, hold fast. I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to sea no more. No more, no more, to go to sea no more. I made
made up me mind that I was inclined to go to see no more. As I was walking down the street, I met sweet Angeline. She said, Come home with me, me lad, and we'll have a cracking time. But when I awoke, it was no joke, I found I was all alone. My silver watch and my money too, and my whole bloody gear was gone. Was gone, was gone, my whole bloody gear was gone. It was when I awoke, it was no joke, for my whole bloody gear was gone. As I was walking down the street, I met Big Rapper Brown. I asked him if he would take me in, and he looked at me with a frown. He said, last time you was paid up with me, you talked up no score. But I'll take your advance and I'll give you a chance to go and to see once more. Once more, once more, to go to see once more. I'll take your advance. Sometimes we're catching whales, me lads, but mostly we get none. With a twenty foot oar in every pour from five o'clock in the morn. And when daylight's gone and the night's coming on, we rest upon our oars. And oh boys, you wish that you was dead Or snug with the girls ashore Ashore, ashore Or snug with the girls ashore Oh boys, you wish that you was dead Or snug with the girls ashore Come all you seafaring lads that listen to me song When you go a big boating boys make sure you do not go wrong You take my tip when you come off a trip don't go with any horse but get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more, no more to go to see no more. Get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more. see no more get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more